everybody. Welcome to an introduction to static site generators for Drupalists. Hopefully you're in the right place. Um, I will uh, keep this short uh, because I've, uh, you, you may have already heard from me in some capacity at this camp, but I'm uh, Brian Perry. Um, I like components, the Jamstack, which we'll be uh, talking about a little bit today, and Nintendo. I'm on the internet in a bunch of places and uh, would love to internet with you. And uh, I work for a company called Bounteous with a bunch of uh, great Drupal folks. Drupal is one of uh, a handful of things that we do. Um, the most important thing uh, that I'll mention is that we do have uh, a, an open listing for an architect role. So I'd love to work with you if that's the sort of thing you want to do. But uh, let's jump in and talk about uh, static site generators. Uh, so give a little bit of uh, an overview. but. Just a quick mega informal poll, like who has used a static site generator before? Awesome. Of you people who raised your hands, how, how many of you have used it with Drupal in some capacity? Okay, cool. Great. So it should be something interesting for almost everyone. And if not, there's this. <laughs> so, uh, so let's talk about what a static site actually is. This is the Space Jam website. Uh, thankfully, recently there have been no uh, new negative connotations with the movie Space Jam, but we can still use this as a great example <laughs> of a static site. Maybe there was some sort of rudimentary uh, CMS-like thing that this site was built with, but I bet it was probably just painstakingly coded by hand so you can get your super awesome Space Jam wave files. Um, but it's definitely a, a static site now, just HTML uh, and CSS. Uh, this is the Captain Marvel website uh, recently, which is also really awesome. I, I poked around at it to try to figure out if it was really static. I, I wouldn't have been shocked if I looked at it and it's like React that does all this. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I don't think it is. There is some JavaScript, but it, it does feel like it's mostly uh, you know, static and, and pre-built, but nonetheless a, a cool uh, little site. But. Uh, no, all static sites don't have to look like this. <laughs> uh, this is another example of a static site. This is the React documentation, which happens to be a Gatsby project. Um, so all of the docs are generated statically. And then another example of uh, uh, something that happens to be a Gatsby project, this is just a great example, is outrider.org. Um, and this uh, kind of you know, makes you think a little bit differently about what static might be. This is a really cool, uh, animated, really fluid and responsive site where a lot of what you get is a pre-generated static bundle. I think there's a couple of places where it might reach out to an API and rehydrate some of the app, but um, the static site doesn't have to look like the Space Jam website. <laughs> So uh, now that we know what a static site is, although I'm sure we all did, uh, we can talk about what a static site generator is. So it's a tool that generates a static build of your site, HTML, CSS, maybe JavaScript, uh, based on some raw data source that you give it. Um, and that data source is often marked down, but it could be a whole host of other things, like a database, an API, a CSV, some data source that you create yourself. Um, and it usually makes sort, use of some sort of templating engine uh, so that you can format the data as it's passed through uh, the static site generator. And uh, because the end result is uh, static assets, um, you don't really require the larger lamp stack that we might be familiar with as Drupal people, uh, and you can host it pretty much anywhere. If you can't host static HTML, is it really a web host? I don't know, existential question. <laughs> Uh, a lot of uh, tons of different projects, a lot of really popular projects. Jekyll uh, is kind of the big uh, grandfather of them all. Uh, Hugo and Hexo are popular. Gatsby is really popular in the, the Drupal community. I mean, we even got somebody wearing Gatsby clothes. So, um, But there's tons of them. So uh, talking about some of the advantages to <coughs> a static site. Speed is one of them. Browsers are great at rendering static HTML. Um, you can put uh, it on a CDN so it can be distributed and delivered fast to the people that are going to your website. There's advantages from a security perspective because your data only needs to exist at build time. 
So it doesn't have to be available all the time. It could be password protected behind a firewall or just literally totally spun down. Um, and we talked a little bit about the, the stack. It's a lot easier to, to scale and a lot cheaper to host these static assets. And then depending a little bit maybe on the tool that you're using, there can be some uh, improvements in developer experience. You don't have to have a full VM, pull down and sync a database file to be able to get a build up and running. And then you might be wondering, uh, you know, I, I like Drupal. We all love Drupal most likely here, or maybe we're trying to infiltrate this, the community in some weird way. But um, <laughs> uh, So why would you use a static site generator with Drupal? Um, I, I like to think about all the effort that we go through to make our Drupal sites like static-like, so that when uh, they're being rendered, they're as close to static as possible. Think about varnish and memcache and the layers and layers of caching that we have within Drupal. It's a, it's a lot of work when, in some cases, we might actually just be able to always have something that's static. Um, think about the, uh, the next security update. Uh, there was one Wednesday while I was in the training, for example. Um, and you know this might uh, change the game a little bit here in that you don't necessarily have to have your, your Drupal uh, CMS available all the time just to build or, um, you know, uh, password protected, so only content editors are looking at it. Impact on hosting. And then the last one is, is kind of interesting and maybe a little counterintuitive with this audience, because I know that we have things that we want to improve in Drupal's admin UI, um, but it's still uh, a really solid uh, content editing experience, especially compared with uh, like not having one at all or editing markdown files. Um, so it, it can be a major advantage. All right, so we're, we're gonna, everybody, everybody still doing good? All right, uh, so we're uh, gonna look at the static site generator landscape from a Drupal perspective, specifically through the lens of three projects. And again, there are billions of them. Uh, but I feel like this is a nice little sampling uh, of projects that all have their little slightly different twists on uh, static sites. So the first one we'll talk about is uh, Jekyll. And Jekyll kind of, it was definitely the first project that introduced me uh, to this modern take on static site generators. I'm sure there's older ones. Um, but it's a Ruby project. It uses uh, a templating engine called Liquid. Uh, typically, the data is going to be Markdown. Most of what Jekyll expect is, expects is Markdown coming through it. But it can look at YAML and JSON and CSV data sources. It also uh, kind of introduced me to the concept of having uh, content inversion control. So you have your markdown content potentially committed um, so that it's in source control rather than in your database. Um, it's supported natively by GitHub pages, which I think uh, really helped its popularity. It also supports incremental builds, and not all of these tools do. So incremental builds, it's only going to, when it does the build process, look at the stuff that has changed rather than going through all of the content to create a new build. And yeah, it's uh, super duper popular. So uh, Jekyll certainly is not the one that I use uh, the most frequently, but just to go through a few things at, at a high level, here's what uh, data is gonna look like. This is actually just an example when you spin up a default uh, Jekyll instance, but it's Markdown. So there's front matter at the top, um, and a few of those things are kind of Jekyll specific, like the layout. Um, and then it's just Markdown that you probably are already familiar with. Um, there's a few things that Jekyll can do in there that are specific to Jekyll, like the, the code snippet highlighting and stuff like that. Um, but it's valid Markdown, and HTML can be valid Markdown, so there's a lot of stuff that, that can be in these files. And then templating, it's uh, liquid. Uh, even if you haven't used this templating engine, I, I would think that it's probably gonna be reasonable for you to work with if you're familiar with other templating engines. Uh, it also even looks reminiscent to Twig in some ways. Um, so while there's a few uh, little bells and whistles that you'll have to become familiar with, um, it's probably something you can work your way around. And then talking about using Jekyll with Drupal, um, from my experience, there, there really aren't a lot of kind of formal options with Drupal 8. Uh, Jekyll has this concept of importers, um, and there are importers for Drupal 6 and 7, but not like a final finished version for Drupal 8 that I could find. 
And what those do, uh, they look at the Drupal database and basically export a bunch of stuff as Markdown that you can then feed into Jekyll. Um, so if you wanted to use Jekyll, then what would you do? Um, so any way you can get your data out of your Drupal site as flat files would work. Um, also, you could do things like uh, a CSV views data export to get your data into something that Jekyll could read. Um, it can read an RSS feed, so that might be another way to get that data into Jekyll. Um, and then you can also put like any YAML or JSON or CSV data in the data directory. So there's a lot of ways to do it, but really not as many kind of prepackaged, ready to go with Drupal ways when compared to some of the other things that we'll look at. And then, uh, just this is a really simple uh, like demo example that I put together, very little effort <laughs> into it on the theming side, but uses the data from the Umami demo profile, um, gets them into uh, Jekyll, and just has a static list of all the posts, and you can drill into the details of all the posts, and it's nice, fast HTML. So thinking about Jekyll, uh, Jekyll might be for you if you want a simple road tested option, you want your uh, content inversion control, although that's maybe less specific to Jekyll now that I read that out loud. Um, but Markdown and uh, flat file data is, is practical for you and uh, you also have to not hate Ruby. <laughs> This slide with additional resources, um, mainly leaving it here for the video and also the slide deck is up online. Um, but uh, the Jekyll docs are great. Uh, Media Current has a blog post. Uh, I, I believe their still current version of their site is a, a Jekyll uh, and Drupal project. And there are some similar projects as well. Hexo is a node uh, side side generator. Hugo is a Go, is supposedly super fast. And Eleventy is another node uh, generator that's really stripped down and simplified, as I understand it, but I've been hearing a lot about it recently. So on to Gatsby, uh, which is great because this is covering for a, a Gatsby session, and maybe some people came here just for Gatsby. Um, but Gatsby, uh, the way they pitch themselves now is uh, it's used to build blazing fast apps and websites with React. And they've kind of changed their positioning. They used to actually talk about using it as a static site generator, but now they focus on the fact that it's React, and it's also just an easy way to create a performant React app. So it's a React project, uh, templating, which is a little bit loaded of a term here with Gatsby, we'll, we'll look at that, but it, it uses JSX, which is React. Um, Gatsby uses GraphQL to query the, the data that you're importing into the system. It has a thriving plugin ecosystem, so that could be like actual React plugins that you're going to use on your site, things like you know, CSS and JS styling options, other libraries, but also they have the concept of uh, source plugins, so it's possible to have um, easily configurable, configurable plugins to get data from a variety of data sources, you can even use them together. There's a, a Drupal plugin, there's a WordPress plugin, there's probably plugins for many of the things. Uh, that you're looking for. And it's really, really fast. Um, it does uh, preloading uh, using the what, what's called the purple pattern, I believe, but it uh, preloads uh, based on like links that are uh, about to go into the viewport and a, a bunch of fancy things like that, so that oftentimes when you click on a link, the data has actually already been loaded on the <coughs> client side, and it's instant. To the point where, if you haven't, if you haven't actually uh, clicked around and tried out a Gatsby site, definitely do it. But the first time that I did it, it was like so fast that it was like kind of weirdly off-putting. Like websites aren't supposed to be like this. <laughs> um, and it, it's not just for static sites. So uh, it's React. So you can uh, statically build a bunch of uh, routes and then have other portions of the app that still hit an API and, and rehydrate uh, as needed. So uh, a little bit about installing and running Gatsby. So it's a node project, so you'll uh, require your package JSON, and then you can run uh, npx, Gatsby, new, and then the name of your project. Um, that's how they recommend you do it now in the latest version of NPM. Um, 
you could also install, they have a, like a global version of the Gatsby package that others might be familiar with that approach. And then in your project, you can run npm run develop, and that's going to launch a little local uh, uh, web server uh, that does hot reloading, so you can see your changes reflected instantly in the, your web browser when you make them. And then you can create a production build by running npm run build, so that's going to create a production optimized bundle that you can then host somewhere. And you can run npm run serve, and that will actually allow you to, to test out and tinker around with your production build locally. Um, and you should definitely do that. I've been bit by not doing that. Sometimes there are problems, and you shouldn't put them up on hosting until you've looked at them. Uh, or there's also the concept of, uh, of starters. They have a, a bunch of starters. Um, some of those have like elements of theme, so a particular look and feel. Some of them are configured to work with certain uh, data sources. So there's like a uh, there's a, a Drupal starter now. There's a blog starter. There's you know baseline starters, portfolio starters, all kinds of stuff like that. So it's another place you can start. So talking about data. Uh, for Gatsby, it actually can be a handful of different things. So it could just be a React component that's in your source pages directory. So this is actually just going to render, render out, you know, it's a default example from the kind of default starter um, that just renders out a basic page with a heading that says hi, and then you can have other pages that link to each other in the pages directory. Uh, more interesting, uh, you can deal with data from other sources, like Markdown from the file system. So this is uh, gatsbyconfig.js, which allows you to configure these plugins with, along with a handful of other things. <coughs> so it's saying that we're going to use uh, Gatsby source file system as a plugin to get stuff from a directory in the file system. And then it's using the Gatsby transformer remark plugin to parse uh, the Markdown data. Um, so you can do some cool stuff like have uh, teasers and the renderings of the markdown data and all kinds of stuff like that. And a lot of other Gatsby plugins assume that you're using markdown. So uh, if you can get your data to be markdown in some way, there's a bunch of other cool things that you can do in the plugin ecosystem. And then uh, your queries to get your data are GraphQL, as I mentioned before. So this is. Graphicool, Graphicool, I still don't know how to actually say that, but it's a really cool uh, um, browser tool which lets you construct GraphQL queries and see the result. And as somebody who was new to GraphQL, I probably wouldn't have been able to get anywhere without having this, but it has built-in documentation, and you can preview your queries um, and then add them to your components. And it also lets you kind of see the structure of things. So you can see the structure of your data after it's brought in from Drupal, for example, here. And then on the templating side, and, you know, templating's in uh, kind of air quotes here because there's a, a lot going on. It's, at the end of the day, a React component. Um, but there is, um, you know, JSX that renders out the, the data here. So this is from the using Drupal example in the Gatsby mono repo. But, uh, so it's rendering out all of the recipes from the Umami uh, demo data. But also at the bottom of the component, there's this uh, GraphQL query that's defined. And that, you know, based on what we saw before, is getting all of the recipes from our Umami demo data. And that's the data that's available to your component that you can then spit out on the page. And because you define those queries in advance, it can build things statically and make things super fast. <coughs> And then using Gatsby with Drupal, uh, there is a Gatsby source Drupal plugin that works with uh, the JSON API module. So you have to have JSON API exposed. And then in your Gatsby config, you can specify what the base URL of your API is. And then the plugin at, uh, at build time, it goes and hits the API, crawls everything, and brings all of your data into Gatsby's API so you can query it. And it does a bunch of cool stuff at the same time. Like it can handle reference entities for things like images. It takes the image from Drupal and makes a local copy of it. So you're not referencing the Drupal site. Everything's part of that static build. You can pass it through some of the image manipulation plugins that Gatsby has. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, you get all of the data from Drupal 
um, queryable in uh, GraphQL. And then this is, again, from that uh, using Drupal uh, demo and a mono repo, just a different representation of the Umami demo data in a nice, fast Gatsby site. So Gatsby uh, might be for you if uh, you prioritize performance, uh, you like React, um, you want flexibility in your data sources, and you know that's also true of potentially something like Jekyll or some of these other options, but the way that everything is kind of combined together in that GraphQL schema opens up some interesting possibilities. And as I understand it, there were also some new features in Gatsby that let you uh, kind of modify the GraphQL schema so that you can kind of normalize data from different data sources. So there's a lot, a lot of power there. Um, you want to use GraphQL to have control on the front end of, of the data that's available in your components. And also, it's a great option if you want to go beyond static. So maybe part of your app is static, and then there's some uh, typical React fanciness beyond that. So the resources, the Gatsby docs are great. There are so many tutorials and blog posts and talks uh, in the Drupal world about Gatsby and Drupal. Um, that I'm not even going to try to list uh, them or one specific one. Um, recently, uh, the, the We Know folks uh, released a, uh, a Drupal starter and a Drupal distribution. Um, it's definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, Benji, who's kicking around uh, here uh, at this camp, also created a, a Lando Gatsby Drupal development environment. Um, so that's worth checking out too. And then the Gatsby Remark Drupal plugin, it kind of ties into the starter and distribution up above. Um, but I think that's really cool. And if you're working with Gatsby and Drupal and haven't played around with that, that's worth taking a look at. It lets you um, process uh, data from like a body field on a Drupal node as markdown. So it again lets you get into some of those markdown superpowers that Gatsby has. Uh, and there are uh, a number of similar projects that are trying to be Gatsby. <laughs> well, Gridsome is the one that's trying to be Gatsby. The other ones are uh, static site uh, options in other frameworks. And also, uh, you might be interested in the Quick Link Drupal module. Um, uh, Mike uh, Herschel from Lullabot uh, released this module recently. It uses a, a Google library that does a lot of that same preloading that um, Gatsby does out of the box, and you can just use it with a regular Drupal site. Um, so if what you want is the, the incredibly fast feeling uh, website, um, definitely take a look at that. Okay, last one uh, we're gonna focus on is Tome. So Tome is interesting because it's a Drupal project. It's a static site generator for Drupal 8, and it's gonna generate a static site that looks like your Drupal site. And it also, exports and imports your, your content as JSON. So uh, you can also use it to easily import and export content across different environments. It does support incremental builds, along with a, a bunch of other nice features. <coughs> Samuel, who's the kind of lead on the, this project, has really been putting a lot of time and effort in doing some, some cool stuff with this. So uh, installing and running Tome, this is from the Getting Started Guide. And I definitely encourage you, if you're interested in, in Tome, to walk through it. It's really quick. Um, but there's a default project you can uh, start with, and then Composer install. And at that point, you can run Drush Tome init, which will do uh, your, an install and export your content. And then at that point, uh, you know, it, this uh, getting started actually uses like a, a local SQLite database. So you can just run a little web server here. But you can go in and edit content and see that the content gets added into the slash content directory, JSON files, images, all kinds of stuff like that. And then at that point, if you run Drush Tome install, it's just going to wipe out your entire instance, reinstall based on all the content uh, that you have exported. And then you can run Drush Tome static, and it just uh, in uh, an HTML directory, I forget what the default actually is called. Um, it just creates a static build of your Drupal site. And you can also install into an existing project, require uh, Tome and Tome Drush, I believe. There's uh, documentation on the project page for that. 
So uh, the data that Tome deals with and looks at is uh, JSON. So it's just a, a big JSON file with a bunch of fun Drupal UUIDs all over the place. Um, but uh, even beyond this, it opens up some interesting possibilities in that you could use this data outside of Tome if you wanted to. And then it's Drupal, so the templating is Twig, which you know and perhaps love. And then the output is going to be what you see in Drupal. Um, there are certainly some cases where there might be things in your Drupal site by default that don't make sense for a static site, so maybe you have to turn those things off. But the whole idea is that you know you look at things in, in Drupal and your static build is the exact same thing. So Tome might be for you if you want to keep using uh, the tools that you know and love with Drupal, but you want a static site. You want your Drupal content under version control or available uh, as static files somewhere else. Uh, another cool use case for this is archiving a Drupal 8 site. Um, you know, maybe that's down the line, but a site that maybe you want to take offline, the content's not going to change, but you still want the actual static content to live somewhere. That's awesome. And then, uh, yeah, so you want to use this file data in another system. But definitely uh, give it a spin. Uh, the docs are great. The getting started walkthrough re is really awesome. Try it out with your site, see what happens. I'm sure they'd love to have issues about things that it can or can't handle well. Um, there are some similar Drupal projects that, that also uh, aim to give you a static site. Okay, so uh, last couple things to talk about is uh, one is automating deployments. So um, perhaps you found a good use case for a static site and you're using it with Drupal. Um, but how does it work when I change my content? Sorry, I, I, I can't search the web on oh, Apple. Go Watch. away, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> uh, so uh, you update your content in Drupal, then what happens? Uh, by default, nothing. Um, but how would we deploy this somewhere? So you could uh, run your build process and then just commit that output and uh, post it somewhere. So you know, put it up on your host. Uh, deploy it to GitHub pages. Uh, that's what I currently do for uh, my personal site. Then uh, there's other hosting options that play nice with static sites, things like Netlify, that's the one that I've used. Um, so they have options to be able to uh, deploy when there's a commit on a particular branch. And it knows how to work with Gatsby and other static site generators, so if there's a commit, it's going to run Gatsby's build process and take the asset and uh, host it somewhere where you can review and then promote to production. And then uh, on the Drupal side, you can also trigger a build with a webhook. There's a bunch of different options for doing this. This is the webhook module. Um, there's also a build hooks module that was uh, released recently to do similar things. It's also not that hard to write custom code to do this, but uh, Netlify, for example, has the concept of a webhook. You can post to it to trigger a build on a specific branch. So you can say when uh, a certain node is updated, then it triggers uh, the build hook. So then, for example, if you have a Gatsby site, it's going to look at all of your data, do a new build, and then that's automatically deployed and ready for you to review, which is pretty cool. And then Tome uh, has some nice uh, Netlify integration as well. And another thing I didn't mention is you can uh, generate static builds, preview the static build in the Drupal UI, and also if you use Netlify, you can trigger a uh, deployment to Netlify from the Drupal admin, which is also pretty cool. And then uh, challenges here, and with the time that we have uh, after this, we can certainly talk more about these if you want to. Um, but. Uh, you might be thinking, well, my site can't be static, and you may be right. Um, but, uh, especially for people who are used to our, our Drupal sites that function in a particular way, I think we have to kind of change our perceptions here a little bit. So, things that could be a roadblock could be the, the volume of your site, the data that you have. So, if your build times take so long and the ch content changes so frequently that they start to bump into each other, that could be a problem. It's a different preview experience from what Drupal offers. Um, really, you have to have a build that you preview somewhere. I know that, uh, that Gatsby is actually working on an offering that's going to improve the preview experience, so uh, that 
potentially is going to start changing for some of these tools. And then things like things that are actually dynamic, like uh, forms or authentication. There are definitely a lot of, of options there, like Netlify and some of these other hosts offer their own solutions for that. Um, for something like Gatsby, any way that you handle authentication in a React app, you could do that. Um, you could use like a Lambda function on AWS to handle some of this stuff. But maybe if you have a, a form-heavy site, Drupal's form API is great. Maybe like that's the real solution and then the static site wouldn't be the right option. But in general, I would definitely encourage yourself to ask your, 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 yourself, why can't the site be static? Maybe start from there and challenge your perceptions and see, you know, is there a portion of the site could be static, um, rather than assuming that everything has to be dynamic. And maybe in some cases it does, but um, definitely think differently about it. Okay, so uh, yeah, the, the few things to, to mention here before we can go on to some other stuff, but uh, contribution day is tomorrow. Uh, would love to see you there from 10 to 4. Amy June is going to be doing a new contributor training. If you haven't done that, uh, it's amazing. Um, I'll also be there helping triage some issues for the, the new admin theme, the Clara theme. So we'd love to work with some of you folks if you want to try to track down some more front endy things. Um, so going to be great tomorrow. And then we'd also love your feedback on this talk. So it's mid.camp241. Fill out the form. I'd appreciate it. And the top rated sessions are going to be captioned, which is uh, also super duper amazing. Okay, so we did we did the first half, and now we're at the second half. Everybody feeling good? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm also in between you and lunch, which is always a risky thing. <laughs> um, so, does anybody does anybody have anything that they want to show and tell or share? Anybody have a static site project or a static site generator they want to talk about? It's cool if you don't. But it would also be amazing if you did. Yeah. I just, I just had to mention Boost. I thought that was going way back. That was such a cool. Yeah, the Boost module. Yeah. Cool way of doing that. that you know, back then. So somebody mentioned the Boost module. Uh, yeah, it is cool. And uh, Tome, I believe, is specifically trying to address some of those use cases from Boost. Uh -huh. uh, one that I remember seeing something about recently is, um, I think Boost had a way to dictate what paths were static and which were not. Um, and there's documentation in the, the Tome guide about how to do that with Tome. So you can pick a chunk of your Drupal set that's static, which is pretty awesome. OK. Um, yeah. All right. So, so we can just yeah, rock some yeah, Q&A, right. I guess. I've got, I've, got a, I've got a question for you. So um, if I was just hand coding a site, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, um, you know, I could put in a widget that was an interactive widget, like if I was using React or Angular to create some sort of like, you know, cool photo thing. Um, can that, is that something that can be done with these static site generators? Because you've talked a lot about them being in Markdown, and what if I wanted to insert an interactive widget inside of one of these sites? So the question was, uh, you know, what if I wanted to include some portion of dynamic content inside of one of these sites? You can definitely do that. It, it varies uh, depending on what the solution is. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so for something like Jekyll or something that, like, that's Markdown based, so uh, any a valid HTML is also a valid Markdown, so that kind of opens the door there. And if you include the right JavaScript, that might be part of the way into it. Uh, for Gatsby, it's just React at the end of the day. So even uh, a page that's initially rendered statically uh, can then do dynamic things. Um, and then also there's, uh, I've never used it, uh, but there is a, uh, I can't even remember what it's called, but there is a uh, an interesting React project that lets you uh, specify React components in Markdown. So that might be also a funky way to have things that are more dynamic in Markdown data that goes into Gatsby. Um, uh, but yeah, it's definitely doable. Uh, one of my coworkers who's interested in Gatsby with uh, a, a project that he's been working on, he has a demo that um, has uh, everything generated statically by default, and then it's possible to authenticate. And then when you authenticate, it knows your location, and based on that, all of the listed data, you know, let's say like available deals or something, 
uh, they update based on your location. So once you log in, you go from the static experience to uh, which is basically just rehydrated data. So part of it is still static. Um, so it's possible. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I can like demo some stuff. Yes. Um, I was gonna say uh, in the past, I've just tried to find some way to do this, and one way I've come up with was like uh, using like HT Track is just kind of this open source project I think where you can just download. You can probably just download any website that's on the internet with it or something like that. So I've done that with some of my Drupal six sites, just kind of download that to. Yep. To, to a site, and it, it's pretty similar to kind of some of these. Okay. Type cool. Of things, I think, but this these probably work a little more better with Drupal too. So. Yeah. So this was HT Track, you said. Yeah. Yeah. So HT Track might be an option to get a static archive of an existing site, older Drupal sites. So one one thing I did find though was like, uh, you know, a website that had a lot of content. You know, each page kind of has a, at least in that thing kind of has its own copy of all the content to some extent. You know, and so. Uh, on a site with a lot of content, it, it started becoming like gigabytes and gigabytes of, of data. So I was like, maybe this doesn't work for huge sites. It works for yeah. small sites. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, about how long do some of these builds take? Like for you know, standard, whatever you want to consider, like a standard site. Yeah, that, that is a, uh, so the question was, how long do these builds take? Uh, that is a tough question to answer because there are, are so many variables. And, and I have not uh, done like production builds that have a, a really, really large data set. They can definitely take minutes. Uh, so like uh, my site, uh, my personal site probably has like 100-ish nodes. Um, and that just takes a minute or two. Okay. Um, but yeah, it can over time uh, scale up. But yeah, that, that would uh, that's a question that comes up all the time. It would be interesting to kind of know where the threshold is. Mm -hmm. um, and I would imagine there's probably some sort of practical limit for the Gatsby source Drupal plugin, for example. Um, so that's a great great question. But but also uh, the kind of flip side of that is, you know how often is the content changing? Like, let's say that your build process takes 45 minutes. Like, God, I hope that's not the case, but does that matter? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Yes? So I'm curious about images. So in Drupal, you know, we can upload an image, we can define image styles to like resize the image for thumbnail, et cetera. Um, when using a static site uh, generator and pulling that data from Drupal, are we able to pull in those images that are already styled and cropped, or do we have to manufacture that with a static site generator? Yeah, so the, the question was uh, images and how do we handle responsive images and or just images from Drupal in general. Uh, you can do either. So there is um, a, um, I'm not going to bring it up, but there's a uh, blog post. Um, there's, a, I think, on the Lullabot side, a series of like decoupled Drupal hard problems posts. There's one specifically about images, and that has some options to be able to, like, using JSON API, get at different um, variants of an image for responsive images. So you can do that. Um, it seems like a lot of work. So if there is an option to do it in your static site tool, that might be the easier way out. Uh, so the, the Gatsby demo does that. So when you refresh the page here, you see that it has that little scale up effect. Um, there's a handful of different image options. So that uses uh, one of the plugins. So I think it's uh, some combination here of Gatsby Sharp and Gatsby Transformer Sharp. Um, I thought there might be one other, but so how that works on the Gatsby side, for example, is uh, when the Gatsby source Drupal plugin crawls the JSON API, it can determine when something is an image, and then when it does that, it takes the image file locally and then creates, uh, might be the wrong term, but what Gatsby often calls a, a node for the image, 
And then it can take that image and pass it through any of Gatsby's image processing. So um, you can define different breakpoints. You can use those image processing options. Um, so in that particular case, that's probably your best bet to let, let Gatsby do it. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Cool. All right. Uh, maybe something over there? No, just a thing. Yes? The, I was just the, the, the Markdown React thing, I think, is MDX, maybe? Yeah. Is that what you MDX, yep. Yeah, the Markdown React uh, plugin is uh, MDX. Yes? Is it time to have people go up and give demonstrations? Yeah. Not... Do you have a, a static? So no, I might just to see some, though. OK. What, what do you want to see? Just an example of you know, what the static site looks like. OK. I mean, I have a Gatsby site up, so I can, I can certainly do that. Um, so this is just the, uh, who, has, who has seen, uh, A, a Gatsby site, or specifically this uh, Gatsby example in the repo? Okay, so I'll only bore you. <laughs> um, so uh, this is what uh, the default Gatsby example looks like here. Um, so it has the umami demo data, and then if I, I click on a recipe, I go to the recipe page, and you know because it did that preloading, it was you know basically instant. You know the image kind of scales in, but the data is already there. It's uh, super duper fast, and then. Um, I think if I open up the console, I can show you a little bit of like what the preloading looks like here. So probably need to bring some of this up, but you can see that as you scroll here, as I kind of hit new portions of the page, it starts to load in um, additional data. Like here, these are some examples of getting like additional content for the page. So I just scroll down, it's doing that preloading. And then since it's running, like I can show you a little bit about like what the developer experience looks like. Um, so here, let's see, this is the recipe component. Um, and I'll get to the page that has that. So go to a particular recipe here. And we see that it's got the prep time and all of the data coming from this particular recipe. Um, you know, if I go here and I change the, the markup, hi, demo, <laughs> save it, um, it automatically just reloads in the browser and we can see our changes there. Um, when you start getting into the data part of that, so on the Drupal side, if you change your Drupal data or the structure of your Drupal data, you actually have to like restart the dev process to get your latest data from Drupal. But if it's stuff on the file system, even if you change your data source on the file system, it just automatically uh, reloads. And you know, it's a React site, and, and the same, same deal with any of these static site generators. Get the data, and then there's a templating layer on top of it, so you can make it look like whatever you want. Um, and then some of them also have things that are similar to themes, like Jekyll has themes, Gatsby has a lot of starters, and they also did introduce a, a concept of a theme as well. Um, any other Gatsby particular questions? Is there, is there any, okay, something? Cool. Yes. I just wanted to say that on, the, on Gatsbyjs.org, they have a showcase of, of nice Gatsby sites. Nice. Like cool. <laughs> yes. So this is a kind of a, a scenario that we're facing. We have these static, they're essentially static sites, but they're in cold fusion. And they're old, and we want to. We want to. We were thinking we would just use React to bring them into uh, to kind of crawl them and convert the data from the cold fusion rendered pages into better on Drupal or wherever. Um, maybe just, just uh, I don't know, JSON. I don't know. But how would you approach that with Gatsby? Could you could you define a source that was. Uh, a template that is a rendered page? Nice, easy softball question. Sorry, How do you uh, migrate a bunch of Cold Fusion sites? Uh, any, no, any, just any, kidding. <laughs> uh, I mean, the Cold Fusion sites were migrated from Dreamweaver templates. So if mm -hmm. you think of it that way, they're, they're templated sites. The Cold Fusion isn't the issue. 
Yeah. The first question I, I would ask, I'm sorry, I just I I'm sorry. made fun of things that are different and scary to me. That's the, <laughs> um, uh, the first question that I would ask is what is the easiest way for you to get at that data reliably? So, uh, and I don't know cold fusion, so I, I don't know what the answer is, but if, if you could expose that data over an API, that would work. Uh, so if it was some sort of REST or JSON endpoint, um, there's plugins for that, um, and you could use that approach. If there's an easy way for you to export the underlying data out of Cold Fusion, you can do that. Uh, is it database exports? Is it you know can you get um, you know some sort of static representation of the data in the Cold Fusion site? But whatever ends up being the easiest way for you to get the data in a reliable manner that you can work with, that's where you start. I mean, not very specific, but hopefully a little helpful. Cool. Thanks for hanging in there. We got, we got this. Any other questions or comments or anything? Was this useful, interesting, good, some nods? For the video, some nods. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, you know, we made it. We made it 15 minutes into the bonus section, so I'll, I'll take it if uh, everybody doesn't have anything else to do. But happy to talk about about this. Uh, if you have other static site ideas, and definitely play around with it, try it out. Um, there, I think there's just some interesting possibilities in the Drupal community and what we can do with these tools. So.